This is the Jim Nog Pod. And I'm your host, Jim Nogero. On today's show, episode 14, Christina Machak. She works for the World Academy of Development, which helps educate orphans in Iraq. Let's start the show. This is the Jim Nog Pod with Jim Nogera. It is the Jim Nog Pod with this Jim Nogera. Welcome to the pod. Today, I have for you all a conversation between yours truly and Christina Machak. Christina Machak is an educator and writer. She earned her MFA from City College of New York, and she currently teaches orphans in Iraq for the nonprofit World Academy of Development. She joined me via Skype. We had a great conversation. We talked about her work there in Iraq, conditions, uh, adapting, acclimating to the local environment. She is uh, an American. And uh, she's someone that I originally knew from uh, City College during my MFA experience. We also talked about her as a writer. And what inspires her? How does she write? And yeah, I just want to thank her again for showing up, for talking with me. Um, The more I do this podcast, the more I enjoy getting the opportunity to talk to interesting people. And now, Christina Majak. Man, it's been a long time, though, that we um, have interacted and talked and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I did remember some of what you read, though. Um, I watched, um, bef- like, um, I had loaded your 007 um, podcast. Oh, yeah. Your, yeah. And, like... It, it was mostly loaded when the internet went out. <laughs> so I watched as much as Some I could. It. Yeah. Um, like 50 minutes of it. Yeah, um, I tend to have long so conversations. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I remembered some of um, that work from our workshop. Yeah. Some of it... Which was, ago. <laughs> which was a long time ago. Yeah, that was 2012? Something like that? Not yeah, I'm not sure. It was Mirsky's class. Right, which I think was maybe fall 2011, I think. Um, okay. Yeah, that was a fun, that was a fun class. Um, although I do feel, looking back, I feel very much um, like I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. Um, <laughs> Neither did I. And I... <laughs> I was such a novice writer. Like, my skills were very un- underdeveloped. I mean, I had one uh, one class, one creative writing class before that um, at Fordham University. And um, I think it was called The American Voice. Um, I forget the teacher's name. Um, but a, a really smart, good guy. And... Um, that's when I wrote a story that I eventually published called Jim and the Parallel Worlds um, about a kid who's traveling into other um, dimensions um, haphazardly. 
Uh, and that's when I realized that I wanted to, um, to, to, to write. I mean, for me, and I'll share a little bit about um, my childhood because uh, I'm curious about your own. Um, because I feel like they're so, they're so formative and in, in who we become. Um, but I used to read a lot at home uh, because I was so, I guess, shy. And I didn't, um, I, I just, other, I, I mean, I wrote about this in, in some of my stories. I, I would stay home and other kids, I would hear other kids in, in the park playing. And, um, and uh, so for me, writing was, this, was an escape. And um, I do remember writing in these, uh, these notebooks, you know, the, those black and white uh, marbled notebooks. Um, I remember writing in them. And um, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I still have some of those just because they remind me of childhood. But anyway, um, yeah, I would write in them and draw in them and uh, copy badly um, R.L. Stein, um, you know, uh, author of the Goosebumps series, uh, which I was really into as a kid. Um, and... Uh, you know, I forgot about that for a while. I thought I wanted to be a pro wrestler. That didn't work out. I thought I wanted to be in a rock band. That didn't work out. Um, but, um, you know, that class originally at Fordham uh, uh, ignited that, that spark again. Um, mm. So I'm curious um, about you because um, we met at a, uh, well, at, at, at CCNY, um, uh, City College, and um, at a uh, fiction workshop, um, which I think was in fall 2011, I think. Um, and uh, what motivated you to to write? I'm curious. Maybe because I couldn't speak about mm -hmm. how I felt. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I think poetry is more natural to me, <clears throat> but for s <laughs> I ended up in a fiction workshop <laughs> um, <laughs> um, because all my life I've been trying to force myself to be who I'm not, mm. hence this now. <laughs> so somewhat similar to you. Um, it seems like everyone's childhood is messed up. So same, same here. Um, and uh, maybe the search for connection and uh, feeling like the deep feelings that I had couldn't be shared with kids my age. Mm even though maybe they were going through the same thing or maybe they had these deep emotions too and I was too walled off to, to find out. Um, and perhaps it's uh, that artistic drive, you know, because you're not just uh, vomiting on the paper hopefully, <laughs> maybe at first you are, um, but there's a craft to it, right? You want to make it uh, something something beautiful, even if it's ugly, mm. even if it's violent, uh, even if it's rage, there is a certain beauty or, or aesthetic appeal to it, hopefully, when you're, when you're finished mm. modeling it and refining it. So maybe there's that impulse too, to, um, to make something beautiful out of the out of the muck and mire. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think there is um, something deep, deeply ingrained in the human psyche to not only build and create, but to 
tinker with and keep trying over and over to to make something better um mm -hmm. that's what that reminded me of um okay I, i'm sorry so let's go back to um sort of introducing you and, and what you do so um i'll let you do that what um what do you do <laughs> Um, tell us about the work that you do with, um, let me check right now, the, the, the official name of, um, of where you work. Um, the World Academy of Development, right? Okay, so tell us what that is and, and where you are. Uh, I am currently in Karbala, Iraq. And uh, the World Academy of Development is... Um, uh, technically a charity organization, a non-profit, mm. uh, and we teach orphans. Mm. Uh, as of now, we have an academy established in Karbala. We have built one in Taksila, Pakistan, and it's about ready to open. And we're making headway in Nigeria wow. um, for the third branch. We also, we teach English, that's what I do, um, math, um, and um, whenever the kids, they have regular school um, here in Iraq, and then they come to us as a, an after school program, so if they need help in any other subject, we do that as well, mm -hmm. uh, and they also play Taekwondo. Wow, um, okay. That's... Yeah, that's uh, a major draw for them. <laughs> it would be for me too. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's that's pretty great. Um, and and uh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, they're orphans. So that's um, in the countries that we're in. Uh, that's a major disadvantage. Um, hmm. To to have uh, to not have a father in particular, um, not just as a guiding um, a source of guidance, but um, as a breadwinner. Yeah. Um, their mothers aren't equipped for the working world. The societies aren't equipped for women to really be working and earning enough to support a family. So um, instead of uh, these children dropping out of school and working, they're with us. And um, hopefully they will end up in college with amazing careers that they have chosen. And our whole um, part of what we do also is we teach them ethics. Mm -hmm. We have a character building class. So, um, they don't just learn to be successful. They learn to be generous as well and take care of others. We instill in them that they um, should be stewards of their community, mm -hmm. leaders of their community, uh, role models for other children. Um, and when they grow up, role, model, role models for um, their family. Um, and hopefully it kind of spreads out as a kind of a web or a ripple effect. So yeah. that, um, you know, our founder started it all with a handful of kids and then every person that those kids touch um, yeah. has an improved life as a result. That sounds like um, really promising um, uh, just valuable work um yeah i mean I, I feel like i sort of help people as a as a academic as a teacher um mm -hmm. but i mean clearly um that that is something worthwhile um to do um well don't compare yourself neg negatively to because yeah i taught i taught at city college too it's mm -hmm. just different it's not mm -hmm. better or worse, you know mm -hmm. you don't always know the impact that you have on someone. You know, That's your a great students point. are always going to tell you 
sometimes have you gotten back reviews and you were so surprised because kids that looked like they were brain dead loved you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you've had that happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've gotten some um, really um, positive remarks about um, about what what you said, like how um, I've impacted them or, or um, and you know, here at Bronx CC, it, um, the student body isn't um, the most well off, right? It's not. It's not the, the 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 demographic that's doing the best in America right now. Um, and um, and having worked at at the writing center at Bronx CC, and also working um, as a teacher. Um, and just being here for a long time, uh, form uh, formerly a student, um, I know a lot of their stories, and I know a lot of the hardship that they go through, and it, and it really is harrowing uh, what some of these um, kids have to go through. I'm talking about, um, you know, you name it, um, uh, domestic violence and um, single-parent homes and poverty and um, children. Sometimes those things combined and um and so yeah i feel like a lot of them just want um someone who won't give up on them some some of them are are, are at that stage um and I, and i do mean that i'm not this isn't a movie moment where i'm trying to play it up um it really is like that for some of them um so it sounds like a lot of things that you're you're trying to do over there, um, and and it's. I think, and Jack, <clears throat> um, I think it's really important that you understand that. Um, I'm not sure that I always understood what my students needed from me. I'm not sure if I always gave them what they needed, the most. Um, and the fact that you have been through it yourself, and empathize and have some sort of uh, intuitive understanding of okay this this one needs this and that one needs that that's really uh, I don't know that's really important it's it's probably more important than the actual material that you're teaching because I can't tell you how many professors I've had who just kind of blew over whatever people were feeling. It wasn't about that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about the students as people. It was just about getting through the course. Yeah. It felt kind of um, malnourished at the end of each course mm -hmm. <laughs> or something. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a good point, too. Uh, I have noticed that there are some teachers that um, I don't think it's their fault necessarily, but they don't maybe understand that that um, that struggle. Maybe because they haven't been through it themselves, and um, you know, I, I think if there was more of a recognition or an understanding of how difficult it is for some students who really just want. Again, some of them to someone that isn't going to give up on them or is willing to listen to them. Um, I think they would be less. Um, I don't know, uh, less not understanding. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I've definitely noticed that too, for sure. Um, and possibly, I don't know, like. I think some professors aren't necessarily open to uh, what's going on inside of their own souls. Mm. They don't even, they're not even completely aware. So they're kind of walled off from themselves and from their students. Wow. So even though they might have gone through trauma um, of some sort, you know, I mean, everybody has PTSD, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> For an extent, uh, they're not reaching anybody because they're out of touch with themselves. 
good observation. Um, I don't know. but I, That just... makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask you about, like, Iraq. How is it, um, like, acclimating to, to that environment? Um, <laughs> I don't know how many people speak English there. I imagine not a lot because... <laughs> um, for those listening they, she just put up a, a zero um, and um, yeah because it's such a different language right I mean it's like how many Americans speak Arabic They're like very few um, anyway um, can you talk a little bit about that sure um, everyone speaks Arabic the Arabic they speak isn't uh it's not the, you know, the Egyptian Arabic that everybody else learns. So that is an extra barrier. <laughs> uh, I found it rather difficult to learn it uh, at all. Uh, just, I don't know, other languages seem to be easier. Um, but my colleagues speak English. Thank God, or thank goodness, and. Um, uh, I use a lot of Google Translate with my students. <laughs> uh, the boys are more advanced because we've had them for longer, and you can you can actually see a big difference between the boys and the girls, uh, not just on the level of English skills, but also um, communication skills. Uh, looking out for one another kind of a community spirit. The boys have that because we've had them for a, over a year now. And the, our influence has transformed them, it looks like. Whereas the girls are just starting out. Um, the, the bridges are being built, but they're, they're still in under construction, so to speak. So it is nice to see that uh, we've had that positive influence on them. That made me think about, like, just cultural differences um, between the um, between the U.S. and, and uh, Iraq, for example. Um, do you feel? I mean, these are these are these are orphans, uh, and I understand that. But um, it it seems to me that, that culturally, um, certain uh, parts of the world, you know, uh, feel that. Um, feel that men are men are to be at the very least more educated than women um, and that they would prefer women to take more traditional roles um, you know uh, care caregivers um, uh, uh, housewives um, and I wonder how much of that do you think affects um, the psyche of um, young people I mean even I'm sure that they notice it in society right even with their own expectations they see what, what other people are doing and I wonder if you feel like that has an, uh, an impact on on, um, on your kids on, on, on the kids there a huge impact yes and you're right that is the case here um, lots of examples I could think of to um, to provide you with evidence of, of the way things are culturally here. Mm. Um, in a way, we're kind of a radical <laughs> organization because we're <laughs> teaching girls. Um, ex like, uh, besides school, we're giving them this after-school program. Um, Sometimes I wonder if it hinders my teaching. Wow. Um, and the character building is very much uh, needed for them. Um, I'm just so grateful that we have these girls because uh, Probably very few people, if at all, are telling them the kind of things that we're telling them. 
um, that they can achieve their dream if they want to be a doctor. It's it can be done. Um, I'm not sure how much I should say here. Hmm. Um, I, I understand. I I kind of yeah. I don't want to put you in a difficult spot. Um, but but there is a there is a cultural um, difference, and sometimes that can have a negative uh, impact. Uh, I think I think that's where we agree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, expectations. Yeah, especially for um, kids that are poor and um, kids that don't have fathers. Mm. And um, some of them do have mothers, but. They, their mothers are not equipped to help them with school because their mothers are not educated. So, you know. Hmm. Um, how bad do you think the, the problem is over there with, um, with orphans? And uh, how much of that do you think is related to um, the ongoing conflict in the region? Well, I... Um, Part of what I do for the uh, academy is grant write, so I did have to do some research on it. Um, there are, it's hard to count, th th make these kind of figures, but as of 2011, there were um, a, around a million orphans. Um, and yes, a lot of what happened was um, the war, right, the U.S. invasion, that took us to 2008, and then there were sectar sectarian atrocities um, for years following that, and it displaced a lot of people uh, within the country. And, um, and then Daesh, ISIL. Statistic-wise, it's like 34 point something percent of children finish high school in Iraq. Um, let me find it. Yeah. Six percent. And that's as of um, 2011. I couldn't find anything um, more recent than that. It was UNICEF who did the survey. So that's dismal, right? <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, it, yeah, that, that's pretty bad. Um, how do you feel the, the region is now? Do you feel like it's um, recovering? Uh, would you make any like recommendations for what you think, I don't know, Iraq needs the, the most? Um, what do you think? <laughs> um. Speaking not as a uh, academy representative. <laughs> sure. Yeah, as an individual. Because I probably shouldn't be too political. Um, uh, Understand. Yeah. When I'm. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. I guess it's a similar problem that you find elsewhere. Um, according to what I found, um, a few people. A few players have the reins of the government, and they just kind of recycle posts. You know, one day they're the bureau chief, the next day they're the minister of war, and then, you know, it just and um, it's kind of like a bottleneck. Right? And so all the profit from the oil stays with them, and very little of it trickles down to the rest of the country. That seems to be the main thing. Um, because one commentator pointed out that you do have representation for the Kurds in, um, in the government. You do have Shia and Sunni um, representation. So it's not that one group is being excluded. It's that um, selfish, that's the kind of mildest word I can use, mm -hmm. uh, uh, politicians are playing the game of politics. Um, and 
the profits they reap, they keep. That's that's the story that I uh, that I seem to have found, um, and that was according to. I can find it. Oh, in Pakistan. Forget. It's way worse. It's just. Um, again, I have to speak not as a, an academy representative. Um, because um, we just, we don't want to place blame, you know, we don't want to get involved in all that. Um, but um, the <clears throat> equivalent of Pakistan's CIA and the, um, the Taliban are like yeah. working together. <laughs> so um, that's the way it looks anyway. Um, all evidence points to that. So, um, and then there are these madrasas, these schools that kind of train people to be extreme. They don't really educate them. They just teach them, honestly, they teach them to memorize the Quran, but they don't teach them what the Quran means. They don't, they speak Urdu, they don't speak Arabic. So they're not, there's a lot that's left out, and uh, they're, they're, uh, these schools kind of breed them and hone them, and then they're all set to join the Right. Um, and the conflict doesn't really help, you know. Um, uh, U.S. involvement oftentimes is very um unfortunately you know i i'm not I, I don't know um all the details of what's happening on the ground but a lot of civilians unfortunately are uh killed when we um when we do operations um i don't know how much of that is avoidable um but it is a lot um especially with with the drone uh program so um Unfortunately, I think that that, you know, kind of um, doesn't work to our advantage um, when it comes to, um, you know, uh, stemming the, the the growth of um, extreme uh, fundamentalism, uh, and um, yeah, that's probably um, a big part of the problem. Um, okay, well, I think it's... Yeah, it's a lot more complicated than, um, than I can even begin to... Even the stuff I do know, it's, it's, uh, it would take a while to explain. And then there's just so many other nuances that I'm not aware of. But, um, it's, uh, it's pretty scary in Pakistan. Um... <clears throat> from what I understand. Iraq, I, they're, they're, they seem, it seems like the country is poor. They aren't poor. They have got plenty of oil wealth, but it's not getting to the people. That's kind of the, the, the uh, trickle, the, the picture that I can give you from what I understand. Which, you know, arguably is not too different from what's happening over here. Um, yeah. You know, w with uh, just funding social programs uh, mm. and so on. Um, yeah, thank you for saying uh, those things that, you know, were a little political. And um, <laughs> I recognize the, the, you know, they were brave of you to make considering your... Um, context um so yeah i think the work that you're doing is is really awesome and i think that um i i really hope that it has um that sort of um what would you call that 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 pebble in the in the pond effect where mm -hmm. that you were describing where the 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 waves keep on sort of echoing 
um, into the future. Um, you know, but with a lot of the the terrorism that has been going on and um, like retarding a lot of the progress and, and that's that that um, the region has been able to make. Um, I just, I don't know. I mean, how optimistic are you? I mean, obviously you're doing the work because you have some sort of optimism. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I don't want to make this, I don't want to tr keep dragging you into the, the politics, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, what do you think? Uh, is there... You're, just give us some reasons to be optimistic, I guess is what I'm asking. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I, so I think it, it's kind of like with most things that seem overwhelming um, or are overwhelming. If, if we look at um, the prospects, they're hopeless. Um, but if you educate one child and love one child, look into her eyes and say, you matter, your ideas are significant, your dreams can be achieved, and I'm giving you the tools to achieve them, that's doable. That's, and even if the world does end, in a day or two, <laughs> um, you, the child feels like she exists for maybe a reason, and in turn, I also feel like something meaningful has happened within myself. Um, I think that's a great message going forward. You know, sometimes I totally agree with that sentiment sometimes you have to go forward um, because it's the right thing to do um, and and what you're doing in the moment is good and, and and you don't need someone else or statistics to validate that you know that what you're doing is is good um, so I would I would agree with that uh, so I don't know if maybe you want to transition now to talk a little bit about um, writing and you as a writer um, you've uh, I assume you've you've published uh, a bit here and there I, I don't really know too much I mean we've uh, fallen <laughs> a little bit out of context since um, since that fiction class um, but um, yeah like Maybe if you want to talk about um, what you like to write um, and what motivates you, that'd be great. <coughs> um, gosh, okay. <laughs> um, lately, what motivated me was anger, just being so disgusted with myself um, for, for not being um, more successful as society uh, perceives success. Um, I have been working on a I guess it's like a, I call it a story, it's not a story though, um, and it's so far two parts are done-ish, and the third part will be about my time here. Uh, what, oh, what do you need from me? What would you like me to say? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess... Um, what kind of well you did answer that original question what kind of things do, do you like to, to write about um, I mean I think that's I think that's good I think we can use that um, 
What's your writing process like? How do you, how do you write? Because, I don't know, that's something that interests me because for me, I very often, um, I, I, uh, I, sometimes I overthink it. And, um, and I end up not doing something. Uh, like I will outline the hell out of something and not end up writing it. Um, or I'll free write something and, um, but then just keep repeating that free writing process and not find something that, that I really, uh, gravitate towards. And so, um, what is your writing process like, if you'd like to share that? And, um, like, are there particular <laughs> things that you do to, <laughs> to find the muse? Uh, what about your, your, your workspace? Do you need your workspace to look a certain way? Um, do you listen to music or white noise when you write? Stuff like that. Okay. Okay, that's a lot of questions. Um... I don't write as consistently as you do, and so partly that may be what you're running up against. Um, when I do something extreme or have, um, like moving to Iraq, <laughs> um, or uh, feel something very strongly, that's usually where it all begins. So, and I don't, for the grant writing, I outline, but um, as for free writing, it's, again, it's not um, an everyday practice with me. It's motive, it, it's uh, compelled by some some event or something that I'm feeling, so... <clears throat> I don't... I find my free writing to be... Uh, it leads somewhere, usually. Um, as for overthinking, sure, yeah. If I try to chip away at something for too long, uh, maybe after a few hours, um, I start to lose steam. If I don't stand up and walk around, have a drink, you know, just put it aside even for the day and work on something else, um, then I lose my clarity. I lose. It's as if I'm. I'm using my mind instead of just letting it flow through me <clears throat> when I've worked too long. Right. So it sounds like there are some things that, like, grab you, and and that's when you know that you, you have to finish this thing, right? And those are the things that you end up finishing. <coughs> yes, and <coughs> I mean... <clears throat> to be fair to you, I mean, you're trying to publish actively. I'm not. I should be. Um, but I, I can, I can have something for years and be returning to it and revising it. I revise, for sure. The, the first time something that I write something, it, it just sounds like um, somebody who's nine years old or something, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> so, um, the, the lack of pressure, you know, I mean, I'm not, because I'm not trying to publish, I, I don't, it, it doesn't feel like a job. And at the same time, nothing is being done. So, 
As, as we talked about before we started this um, Skype call, um, I may get that PhD, and I will be. I will have to put my. I was going to say self. I'll have to put my work out there. So. Yeah, that was an interesting, uh, if I may, like a Freudian type of slip, because, um, yeah, it is. It is like you're putting yourself out there. You know, you're, um, you're. Uh, it, it's such an intimate. It, it's so weird paradox, you know, because uh, writing very oftentimes for me, for many people, um, is uh, very intimate. Um, because you're exposing a very intimate part of yourself, um, a very vulnerable part oftentimes. That's what a lot of good writing, I think, has. But it's also public. Like, you're also trying to publish it, and you're also telling it to people you don't know. Um, and that's a very interesting paradox that... Um, and what if no one reads it? <laughs> that's <laughs> What if people read it, but what if people don't? Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. I, that's a definite uh, concern. Um, what kind of stuff do you like to read? Um, yeah, I'm curious. And how much do you think? How much of that do you think motivates what you write? Oh yes, that is a major. Um, a way to get into the groove is to read, especially good stuff. Yeah. Um, it, it just somehow gets you into the rhythm. Um, music can sometimes do that if it's not too distracting. Um, but uh, I am reading War and Peace at the moment. Um, I'm only 650 pages in, uh, and I'm I'm halfway through, <laughs> so, um, and what else do I read? I love philosophy. It's hard, <laughs> but I love it, and um, uh, one of my friends said to me, well, why do you like to read, like, these old white guys, you know, like, it's so, you know, just going along with the established thing, and I don't know, she, she's kind of, uh, I don't know how much I should say about that, but, um, <laughs> sure. but I, I said, well, it's kind of like reading this, the diary of someone who's really, really smart. <laughs> so like, they're coming up with the same questions that we are about, well, what does it all mean? And why am I suffering? Why do, uh, why does... Why do people die on me? Um, and yet, they're saying it in such an intelligent way, and they have such diverse opinions about all these things. Um, and I guess that's my fascination. Uh, I, I guess... Um, gosh, what do I like? I like old stuff. I... I um, I prefer that to um, most of the like postmodern or, or contemporary stuff that's being written, um, with the exception of science fiction and speculative fiction, that I do like a lot. Yeah, me too. By the way, um, very interesting. Any, uh, what kind of sci-fi stuff do you like? Um, I will get criticized for saying sci-fi, I think. Um, but <laughs> instead of like SF or something. Um, but uh, I, I did gr like watch the sci-fi channel quite a bit. Um, what kind of... Um, I'm curious, like, uh, do you s like stuff like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or maybe more... Um, more I don't know, technical stuff or harder stuff, like maybe, I don't know, um, Asimov or, or something like that. Um, I have not read 
nearly as much as I would have liked would like to in that genre. Um, I have read Asimov, um, the Foundation trilogy, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And um, I've read. I, I had a collection of stories from the '60s. They were fascinating. Uh, I love. I like William Gibson. Um, but as as for like the the really incredible stuff that's being that I know is being produced, I would love for recommendations of mm. stuff that I should read. Mm. I'm not really um, like a lot of my time has been spent trying to figure out what to do. So like researching different like could I see myself doing this job? Or that job, or you know, I I didn't want to get a PhD because it seemed like the people who had them had the same job I had. <laughs> they were adjuncts, so I I I avoided it, and I don't know if I can avoid it any longer. But uh, um, can I just say a hijab is really really hot. Like, not, not in a sexy way, but, like, in a I'm sweltering kind of way all the time. Yeah, um, definitely and I get props for, for wearing that, yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to come home. Mm-hmm. I, I thought that I was just going to give up on life and devote myself to these kids, sacrifice my life for them, and just, like, not have my own life. And um, maybe... Four months into my stay, I thought, granted, I was doing a lot of meditation and a lot of um, psychological delving, so to speak. Uh, So this has helped me along the way, but I would like to come home uh, and enjoy my freedom again. (laughs) Um, Actually, you mentioned that. Yeah, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, but um, yeah, you mentioned that. Uh, how how is that? Do you feel um, do you feel uh, I don't know. I don't know if I want to say comfortable. Well, I think that's a fair question. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. how do you feel as um, an American woman in in Iraq? Uh, do you feel? Um, uh, do you feel, I don't want to say comfortable, because it seems mm-hmm. like it, uh, maybe an oversimplification, but I mean, that's the word that comes to mind right now. Um, mm-hmm. How do you feel as an American uh, woman in, in Iran? Well, people don't know I'm American until, until they ask me if I'm Iranian, and I can't speak enough Farsi to pull it off. They always assume that I'm Iranian, um, which is good. Um, uh, A lot of Shia Muslims from Iran come to visit the shrines. Uh, It's it's a holy city. Uh, There are a number of shrines. So the way I'm viewed is, you know, I dress the same as everyone else. When I go out, I wear an even more simple, a black hijab and um, an abaya, which comes over the head and um, it it obscures your shoulders. So you can't even see the shape of a woman's shoulders. Mm. (laughs) Uh, And it comes to your ankles. and men and women are not even supposed to make eye contact uh, unless you're related or married. So they know the rules, and uh, and I know the rules. And so that's you can navigate. I can navigate that. Uh, 
again, I'm not made to feel like an outsider. Uh, when I when I do explore and walk around a bit, um, there there are tough teachers, there are um, security checkpoints, and uh, for women you go into this kind of building and there's a woman who, who examines you, and um, they, they <laughs> I I look so different that they always gush. And they want to know where I'm from, and they want to look in my eyes, and they want to like they want to talk to me, and I feel bad because my Arabic is just I cannot. I think Arabic is beyond me. <laughs> I just can't learn it, um, unfortunately. So um, so they're warm toward me, in other words. Um, What, uh, one thing that I wasn't accustomed to, um, I guess I'm not accustomed to any of this, but uh, is um, seeing the military men um, with guns uh, just at the checkpoints, uh, which are everywhere. Um, and, um, and they're just regular people. That's the way they see. Um, they could be your neighbor. They could be uh, like they're not um, these hardened kind of uh, stoic, stern kind of. They're not that way at all. Uh, <laughs> for example. Um, <laughs> As I was passing through a checkpoint, um, I had gotten out of the my examination, and um, I saw the the school van with the boys driving in the opposite direction from the way I was walking. And I called to the one of the boys who was sitting by the window, and um, to get his attention and say hello, and um, <laughs> uh, he didn't hear me. But across the way, there were military men, and um, they heard me and went and they called him to get his attention. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So um, they could see that I hadn't got his attention, so they were trying to help me. <laughs> and um, and the van kept driving and. Uh, I did make eye contact with them, and they made eye contact with me. <laughs> um, but we were smiling and laughing, and I, I, I then quickly went on my way. Um, but this isn't the only time this kind of thing has happened. Um, uh, someone from the military helped me when I first arrived. Um, he helped the person driving me into the city. Um, so. It, they kind of remind me of like your uncle, like a good uncle, like someone who um, who's just a, a regular person. And I, I don't know what I expected, but I, it was refreshing. It was nice to find that. Now that I've gone, I waxed eloquent about <laughs> that. <laughs> what else can I tell you? Um, every single thing was. Uh, different than than my life before. Everything, everything. Um, even the way people interact, even um, say among women. Um, sometimes when the girls are talking to each other, they're about thirteen years old, and. Uh, sometimes they kind of startle me with the abrasiveness with which they address each other, and they're not arguing. They're just talking. <laughs> they're just being emphatic. <laughs> um, and so I, I think that I'm very, very different than any kind of teacher they've ever had. Um, uh, much, much more gentle. I, I think over there, 
the kind of dis disciplinarian kind of uh, uh, facade is what's, you know, the kids won't listen unless you are firm with them. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's true. They seem to be okay with me. <laughs> Yeah, living in a desert. I I have not lived in a desert before. Um, just I I I don't know what else to tell you. I sent you a bunch of pictures, but it was very late. It was as you were probably driving, so okay. I don't um, got. I don't recall getting those, but um, I can see your Facebook page. Um, I don't know if you want to share that with people. I'm, I'm not sure how much of this um, is public or not. Um, but I mean, but maybe you want to put up some pictures uh, of uh, that. Uh, publicly, if they're not either on a, on a page or on a blog or, or whatever, um, because they're it's um, it's very uh, they're very striking these images. Um, it, One's on my Facebook. Yeah, um, as a matter of fact, I think someone wrote a comment uh, about uh, you know these images you post are of a place I may never get to see. Thanks for sharing them. Um, that is of the Imam Abbas Shrine. I'm sorry, I'm very ignorant on what's in Iraq. I was until I got here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have no idea what um, uh, any of these uh, names. Um, but, but that's exactly why sharing those stories are so important. So there's, there's an image of that, of, of the Imam Abbas Shrine, and images of women in... Uh, burkas, I believe. Um, abayas. It's what I wear too. Abayas. Mm -hmm. Abayas. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, people in in Iraq, uh, older gentlemen, women with with uh, children, three women uh, walking, um, mm -hmm. and also you get to see some of the poverty here. You know. Um, like there's this one image of it looks like uh, a Nestle mm -hmm. factory or store yeah. which is interesting yeah. because Nestle in particular has been uh, accused of um, just not doing great stuff uh, overseas um, and um, for example like encouraging um, like uh, powdered milk over um, breastfeeding in developing mm. countries, which um, scientific research shows that it's not um, that that children should be breastfed uh, generally mm. because it's just better for their cognitive development and, and so on. Um, but to to get back to uh, what we were talking about, um, yeah, I mean. These are stories uh, that should be shared. And it reminds me, your work reminds me of, um, or these images remind me of um, the work that um, Sam Kimball does, um, whom we've, we've talked about, um, who is also in Iraq, and he's uh, a journalist. And um, he shares, I mean, his goal is to create like a podcast series where he gives... Um, he gives um, first-hand accounts of of people's stories, um, mm -hmm. common, ordinary people in Iraq, um, their stories of. Um, he's mu he's much more political than you are. Um, that's the nature of his his work. Um, but it's so important to for these voices, these images, the, this part of the world to be um, revealed to to us um, because I feel like a lot of Americans in particular don't see that part of the world and have misconceptions about that part of the world 
And, you know, if we're going to be involved in conflict in this part of the world, um, we should uh, know the people. And especially, you know, in America, there's a lot of um, anti-Islamic uh, sentiment and, um, and bigotry. Um, and I feel like recognizing these are, these are you know, intelligent, uh, ordinary people uh, like we are can really help to to educate people. Yeah. Um, I've been lucky enough to uh, photograph the people that I have. It, it is mainly people that I've photographed. <clears throat> and um, by capturing their images, it's almost an act of um, reverence to their humanity. That's the way I, the way I feel about it. Um, and every time I look back at those images, uh, each life seems so precious. People that I'll never know, but um, each one of us in our own individuality making up the whole of humanity uh, it, it just seems miraculous um, and to be able to document it in a way is kind of acknowledging that wow a human life is something precious something irreplaceable and the, uh, if, if when we're done, um, if you haven't received the email with the, uh, with the link to my, um, all of the photographs, um, let me know. And yeah. because you can do whatever you want with them, you can uh, share them. Thank you. And then uh, you were talking earlier about, I'm sorry, I, I didn't respond right away, but you were talking about... Um, like recommendations for um, science fiction and all of that, um, and I didn't I didn't respond to you. Um, I'm not as well read in the contemporary science fiction as I would like to be, but um, one guy that I really like um, today, uh, who writes a lot of fantasy as well, I think. Maybe he's more known for fantasy, but he writes... I think it kind of bleeds over. I think a lot of it is, is very similar. Um, you know, fantasy, science fiction. Um, uh, is Ken Liu. L-I-U. Um, yeah, Ken Liu is fantastic. So, um, uh, a lot of his stories... I mean, he reminds me of uh, Hemingway in that his prose is very... It's it's minimalistic, but it's um, it's deceptive in its simplicity. You know, it um, he has uh, he's just a just a master of of, of prose of of interesting stories with, with um, characters um, uh, meaning that I feel is is deep. Um, and of course, you know, one of the classics, um, Arthur C. Clarke, is uh, is my favorite um, of of the big three. Of um, uh, if we're talking about uh, Asimov, uh, yeah. Heinlein, and Clark, I mean, my favorite is Clark um, of the three. Um, I Which think I started to read one of his. Mm. Um, tell me what. 2000, 2001 is his, I guess, most famous uh, book, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, I argue with people about this sometimes. I think the movie might be better than the book, um, even though it's a great book. It's a great yeah. book, but it, it, the book reveals a lot that the movie doesn't. And I feel like it's the stuff that's missing that makes the movie kind of um, 
more uh, powerful. And, and the book kind of just te- it tells you everything. Um, but it's so well, it's so well written. Um, the, the first couple of scenes uh, about um, early, I guess, pre-humans, um, it's, just, it's just wonderful. Um, like you, he puts you into the mind of, of uh, I guess, uh, early hominids. And, um, and that's such a great way to start, you know. And it, it ties into what we were talking about, um, recognizing, you know, humanity. There's like a fundamental element of, of consciousness that that we can relate to. We can relate to animals because we know, okay, there's a consciousness there. We can relate to each other um, in the same way. And um, we're all on this, this boat. I feel like I'm getting really... I'm, I'm bordering on the line of Deepak Chopra right now. I don't want to go that far. Um, but there's... It's a beautiful thing to to recognize that, that we're all... Let's say... What metaphor do I want to use? We're all bubbles in a, in a sea of consciousness. And, um, and if we're all... If there are more people like you, for example, that are out there trying to make the the conscious experience of another person um, better um, then the whole world would be a better place and I, and I mean that um, so I, I want to thank you for being on the podcast next time on the gym not pod say in particular who will be next it may be CK1844 and a special musical guest it may be my brothers from another mother Noman Jalal and Jose Reyes who will talk to me about religion hopefully in June Noman is a Muslim and Jose is a Seventh-day Adventist so that should be fun Either way, I have some interesting guests coming up, and I hope that you enjoy me. And yes, if you are waiting for me to put out some podcasts where I do some interesting things, I may in fact do that. Music for Jim Nog Pod by Marco Sanlaguagua, marcosanlaguagua.com. Guagua is spelled G U A G U A. Art by Seco1844 at Seco1844 on Instagram. Seco is S E K O. My website, which contains news and updates, bios, social media links, contact info, a bibliography, a blog, and a podcast page, is jamesnogera.com. Nogera is N O G. U-E-R-A. Please show your support by subscribing and interacting with the pod on iTunes or whatever your favorite podcatcher happens to be and on YouTube. You can donate on patreon.com slash gymnog or directly via paypal.me slash gymnog. And thank you for your interest.